being both a developer and an organizer. And they've never lost touch of their origins. They're, um, they were created through an intense community organizing effort in a multiracial neighborhood in Boston. This is my community land trust. I should say mine, mine, and everybody else's in Burlington. But I uh, take just a, a little bit about us through the Champlain Housing Trust. We have 500 resale restricted condominiums and houses. We have 100 units of cooperative housing. We operate two home ownership centers to prepare low income people for home ownership. I mentioned we also have a lot of rental units in our portfolio. And we continue to expand. We do about $40 million of new development every year because we want to grow. Our sense of mission, our accountability to our neighborhood is that you don't rest on your laurels. You keep growing because there are unmet needs out there. And when I say we do development, we do new construction where we will find a lot in the, in the city of Burlington and we will build something new on it. Sometimes we have derelict buildings where we just knock them down and we rebuild or we knock them down and we create a community amenity like a neighborhood park. Again, all of this is on land that's owned by our community land trust. Other times we take old industrial buildings and we convert them to housing or retail space. This was an old bus farm. Vermont Transit ran their buses in to repair the buses. And we finally acquired that site, cleared up all the contaminants in the soil in the building, which are a lot, this an old industrial site. And we converted this into uh, stores, restaurants, the neighborhood wanted uh, retail space in this particular uh, site. And we take old buildings and we just refurbish them and we turn them back into housing. Uh, in both of these cases, they, they were housing for a long time, but it really fallen into disrepair. This one had two fires. We finally bought it, created retail condominiums on the ground floor, and little equity housing co-op on the top floor. And to keep our politicians involved in this, we sometimes allow them to come in and help us with our demolition. This is a picture of our mayor in Burlington, Vermont, wielding a sledgehammer to help us uh, start the rehab of that building. Of course, we put our mayor in, the, uh, in bed for the next week because he strained his back by right? swinging <laughs> the sledgehammer. But that's, you know, the risk sometimes of, uh, of doing this sort of thing. Um, the sort of model that we use and the work that we have done was recognized by the United Nations in 2008. We won a UN World Habitat Award for the Global North, recognizing this as a model that could be replicated in other places. And the nicest part of winning this award, uh, you don't get a lot of money, you don't get a whole lot of recognition, but the year after you win this award, they encourage people from other countries to come visit you and take a look at what you've done. And we had, the next year, people from 14 different countries come to visit Burlington, take a look at the Champlain Housing Trust as part of the, the UN The Study Visit. And uh, you may recognize this fellow right here, <laughs> but all. Dave was part of that uh, particular study visit, along with two other people from London, I believe. Uh, accompanied you. Okay, that's kind of the punchline. That's where we're at today. Where did we come from? Um, so I was going to talk just a little bit about what this model is and where it came from, at least in the United States. So I guess the first thing to say is that every community land trust is not identical because we put a premium on the community identifying its own needs, its own priorities. We expect that this model is going to be taken and reworked and refined in different ways in almost every community that's applied to it. We have community land trusts in urban areas, in inner city neighborhoods, big metropolitan areas like San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta, Syracuse. But we also have community land trusts in the Adirondacks, in the Appalachians, in the rural areas. So we have an you know, resort communities out on islands. We have a lot of college towns that have community land trusts, so a tremendous amount of variety. But having said that, I mean, at least what I can give you the classic model 
with well, the understanding that we take these elements and we rework them, right? Uh, these are, are not hamburger franchises, Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises, where everyone looks exactly alike. So people take them and, and change them. So we can group the features of what it is to be a community land trust, at least in the United States, by the three words, community land trust. And we give it kind of meaning here is that this is a unique way of owning the real estate, of structuring the organization, and then operating the organization after you've created it. So I'm going to talk kind of separately about what makes a CLT unique under each one of these clusters, and also kind of the origins of the model and have different histories for each one of these clusters. But it won't come together at the same time. The oldest elements are the ownership elements, the way we treat real estate. And this is basically the way we do community land trust in the United States. We have one party that owns the land, which is a nonprofit corporation that owns the land, and you have another party that owns the structural improvements on the land. And what ties it together is a long-term land lease. I yeah, should just stop there for one minute. So the nonprofit owns the land, and we sell off the structural improvements. And those structural improvements can be anything. Remember my, my quick little walk through our projects. It's not just single family housing. Anything you can build, put on housing. You can build it on one land, you can build it, you can sell it. So the homeowner or the cooperative or the business owner has a deed to the capital improvement, to the structural improvement. The nonprofit community based organization holds title to the land. And the nonprofit never resells the land, but does sell off the improvements. Yeah? Okay. And it's the ground lease that ties everybody's interest together. All right. I went to going quickly so we can cover a lot of history and a lot of ground and leave time for a conversation. Now, this idea of community ownership of land and treating land and improvements in a different way is not your typical way of looking at land, not particularly in the United States. I mean, in the United States, every American believes that land speculation is his God-given right, right? We should be able to go out and buy up as much land as we possibly can in anticipation of development and make everybody else pay the price. In fact, there was a 19th century American economist named Thorstein Devlin, who said that baseball is not the great American game, it's really land speculation. Many of our founding fathers, George Washington, Patrick Henry, Nathan Hale, were all land speculators. In fact, there's an argument to be made that the real reason for the American Revolution, where we decided to cast off the English shackles, was because King George forbid the colonists from <coughs> grabbing land west of the Alleghenies. So if it were not for King George um, disrupting the great American game of land speculation, then I would be talking in an accent that you could probably understand a lot more easily. <laughs> understand what I'm saying. Yes? But even though land speculation is the great American game, there were people, even among the founding fathers, I'm afraid there weren't too many founding mothers in our history books, but there were a number of them that really did think that we should treat in this new nation, in this new body of law, we should treat land differently than we treated the structural improvements on them. It was an Englishman who wrote Common Sense, a revolutionary fiery pamphlet that helped uh, spark our revolution, of course we were all Englishmen in these ways. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, felt that it was crazy to, uh, to just allow endless speculation, individual ownership of land, we should treat it separately. And of course, the Native Americans always thought it was the craziest thing they had ever heard of when the white men moved west and said, you know, we're going to own land, we're going to buy and sell land for the highest price. Now, the fellow in the United States that took this the furthest, this idea of treating land as the commonwealth, 
differently than the structural improvements, the only name in 